Maybe one of the ways to think about vulnerability is look at it as teachable moments. The first element of this is you recognizing a vulnerability and learning yourself. What can I learn from my vulnerability? How can I stop wallowing in it or fretting about it or worrying about it and actually figure out a way to make it work for me? How can I overcome it or how can I repurpose it to make it into something that's valuable? This is the Leadership Foundry Podcast. I'm your host today, Brandon Smith, and I've got my fellow host and co-host and partner, Randy Hain, joining us today. Randy, how are you, my friend? I am doing well on a, a cold and rainy Friday morning. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, I, maybe this is a perfect time for our topic, but you and I were speaking, and so many of our clients, as we're moving into the year, as leaders, are struggling with something we all struggle with vulnerability mm. when oh. and how to be vulnerable and how do we do it in a way that brings people along particularly in times of uncertainty so i know this is something that you know you've had lots of conversations with your clients about so so maybe let's start there randy what have you been hearing what is some what are some of the challenges you're hearing around this this topic of vulnerability you know, it's um, I'm really I'm really glad that we're talking about this because I think it's a theme that uh, that weaves itself through just about every coaching relationship I have. And it's interesting to me because um, we talk about vulnerability and I think people have a misunderstanding about what vulnerability is. Maybe just for our purposes today, we might want to build a foundation of, you know, why does it matter? And then talk about why people don't do it. You know, I think we both would agree some of the best leaders we know are the most vulnerable leaders. I, I mean, we, we both know those kinds of leaders, men and women that are fa fabulous at sharing uh, a bit of themselves. And as I'm working with the leaders that I'm coaching, there's just, there's a fear. There's a, there's this fear that gets in the way sometimes of, of sharing vulnerability. There's a, a worry about being judged. There is a, a worry that it's going to be used against them. Um, and sometimes, and I think this is very common, I think a lot of the leaders I work with don't know how to share vulnerability. They don't actually know how to give it words. So I think we both would agree it's really important, but I do find that there's just this, this fear and worry that just gets in the way of leaders doing it well. Is that what you see? I mean, because I, I yeah, see I that. So. I think so, Randy, and I am so glad that you said, let's start at the beginning, because yeah. I have this is stuff you and I think about all the time. So we just throw out the word vulnerability. And for some people that, first of all, that's a scary word. Mm -hmm. Let's honor the fact for some people they're like, well, okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop listening to this podcast uh, right about now. Right. Uh, but I think it's important to level set. So this is when I think of a very simple definition of vulnerability, vulnerability is dropping all of your armor and weapons, mm -hmm. dropping all of them, taking all your armor off, <clears throat> put your sword down. And for a lot of us, that is scary yes. because if we do that, if we kind of expose ourselves, what's the other person going to do? That's what we think to ourselves. And if we grow mm -hmm. up in a, um, with a, with a life experience or a journey where people took advantage of us, we are not inclined to want to drop our armor and weapons. Right. And so we don't want to do that because we don't know if someone's going to take advantage of us. Now, the reason why this matters is. And so we talk about vulnerability as leaders. And naturally, when you say leaders, we think vertical and that's mm -hmm. true. But where you and I see it play out almost more importantly is with peers yes. at the executive level. Yes. Right? You're, you're, you run sales. You got to go over there to finance and need to have a conversation. And you two are always kind of in contention. Someone's got to drop their armor and weapons to change yes. that conversation. Someone's got to say, I need your help. And that's a great example of vulnerability. I need your help. So even for right. people thinking, listening today, if you want a, a baseline litmus test on how vulnerable you are, mm -hmm. how often do you say, I need your help? Uh, that's, right. that's maybe a great way to do it, but it, it's an invitation, but it is scary. So, so I think that's another way to kind of think about it. But yes. I think it's so, so very, very important. So I love what you just said. And let me, let me piggyback on that just a little bit, because I think that there is a, um, there's a fear that it's all or nothing with vulnerability. I think that people are concerned about, I've got to share all these deep emotions, these, these secrets that are only mine, these, these uncomfortable places. And it's, it's not that at all. Somewhere between zero and your worst fear is probably where you need to land somewhere on that spectrum. 
And people, but they all, people often think when they think vulnerability, I'm going to be exposed. Uh, people are going to see that I'm not perfect, which is kind of funny because none of us are perfect, but we all want to show up as, you know, invincible and perfect. And yet we all know that we're not, which is kind of an interesting paradox. So I think that if, if folks listening to this would just consider that what you just said is a wonderful way to share vulnerability. I don't have the answer. My team's going to miss the deadline. We own it, but we're going to miss the deadline. Hey, I'm, I'm struggling over here. I sure could use your help. These are all forms of vulnerability. Um, and if we would just understand that letting people see that we are human, that we do have, you know, weaknesses and flaws just like everybody else and kind of act on that. I think the I think that collaboration would increase, trust would increase. You talk about the trust formula all the time. There's so many things that get activated when we practice vulnerability well. Okay, Randy, I got lots to say to this. Excellent. Okay. okay. So when I think about vulnerability and the way I want everyone listening to this to think about it, think about it as a swimming pool. As Randy kind of said, it's kind of you know, zero to all in, you think of it as the pool. So you can get in and just kind of put your feet in and, and, and get in the shallow end of the pool, wade in a little bit. You can get, get into where it's about waist level. Okay. And then of course you can go where you're, you're underwater, right? It's, it's a deep end of the pool. Okay. We don't necessarily need to talk about deep end of the pool. That might be saved more for people really, really special in our lives. And that's where intimacy lives. So if you want intimate conversations, intimate relationships, whether they're professional or personal, you can't have it without vulnerability. Okay. That, that's, that's the right. mic drop statement. If you want deep relationships, you can't do it without vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that deep end of the pool, we may save that for our personal relationships, but the shallow end of the pool, yes, we need to be doing that. And the reason why that is so important is, as Randy said, is it, it, it really helps to invite people to come along with us. Um, now, why it's so counter to our instinct is because we're a leader. We just got promoted. We're now a senior vice president. We should have all the answers. So now Brandon mm -hmm. and Randy, you're telling me I'm going to go out there and tell folks I don't have the answers. Yes, that's exactly what we're telling you when appropriate. But if you'll notice, the way nothing Randy will draw people to you more than anything. Yes. And the way Randy said it, I want you to listen real close because when Randy used phrases, he was using them in a way that was balancing masterfully vulnerability and still showing I have confidence. I've still got mm -hmm. it. My team owns mm -hmm. this. Okay. He's own. he's he, confidence. I'm a leader and we're going to miss the deadline. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's this mm -hmm. balance of I'm not losing anything by being vulnerable. I think that's, we think that we're losing our power when we're vulnerable and all that work that Brene Brown does tells us that that's actually not, not true. Mm -hmm. So Randy, you're going to appreciate this. I think this reminds me of the Seinfeld episode where George Costanza decides he better just do the opposite <laughs> of everything he's ever done before. So if you know that episode of Seinfeld, George yes. realizes things aren't going well in his life and he just decides, I'm just going to start doing the opposite. So, you know, he goes in and interviews with the New York Yankees and he's like, Mr. Steinbrenner, these are all the reasons why you've run this club horribly. And then at the end, Steinbrenner says, fire this man. So I think it's the same thing because our instinct is not going to tell us to be vulnerable. Our instinct is going to say, hey, you should put more armor on. <clears throat> you should get more weapons out. That's how you keep yourself safe. Mm -hmm. And all it does mm -hmm. is it makes other people do the same thing. Okay. So let me say that again. We match levels to people. If you come into a meeting armored up, that is going to naturally encourage the other party to do the same thing. So if you've got a peer you've got conflict with and you're like, I'm going to come in with all the reasons why they're screwing up and I'm with all the data and you better be prepared. They're going to do the same thing. And now you're going to court. And I yeah. don't think that's, we. I don't think we're trying to litigate with our colleagues. So right. a, another, another way to think about it. So Randy, that was all the stuff going on in my head. And I wanted to give you a little uh, George Costanza for, to, to kick off our day today. Listen, I, I thrive on a good juicy Seinfeld reference, so always good. You know, it strikes me that, um, you know, as we as we kind of think about what we're talking about, we're actually talking about the stages of vulnerability. So we, we kind of took you through that high level. Vulnerability is one of the most attractive traits for all leaders. We, we both agree. We've seen it. We, the, the leaders we admire the most all demonstrate vulnerability. 
But I think we've also talked about vulnerability exists on a continuum. It's a spectrum. And there are all kinds, I mean, there's there's a little bit and then there's a lot to your, to your point. And you have to use good discernment and judgment about what to share and when to share. So we, we agree on the continuum. But I'd also like us to think about, and this is maybe stage three of our process, that vulnerability, you know, it, it, you need to open the aperture of your thinking regarding vulnerability. What if we start to look at vulnerability as not only something that we uh, probably should do more of, but maybe it could actually be a very positive force for good? What if we start to see it as something that can create hope and inspiration and help other people? Let me give you two examples. So you have often heard me talk about and I often write about uh, my older son, Alex, who has autism. Now, for many people, having a special needs child is an incredible source of vulnerability. I feel vulnerability about that. But I also can tell you that my wife and I have, have really spoken about this for years. We have such a blessing in our son, Alex, and he inspires others. He gives hope to other people. So we talk about Alex. Yes, it's vulnerable, but we also know that it inspires other people. People get hope when they see the things that Alex can do in his life. Um, another example, a few weeks ago, I wrote a post called The Confessions of a High-Functioning Introvert. So for a lot of people talking about, you know, social anxiety and being an introvert or an extrovert, those things can make people feel vulnerable, a little nervous about talking about it. And what I gave in the post was an example of my difficult journey to recognize that I'm a high-functioning introvert, but I turned those challenges, maybe those weaknesses that, that affect others, I turn them into strengths for myself. So I figured out different ways to connect with people, different ways to socialize. So my point is sometimes, and, and this connects to storytelling, which I'd love us to talk about today, telling your story and giving people a glimpse that you're human, that you've had some adversity, uh, you've made mistakes, you sometimes are not good at something, as an example to others that, hey, I dealt with this and I, I was able to overcome it. That's a really good application of vulnerability for all professionals, but especially leaders. If you're talking to new colleagues, younger colleagues, peers you're getting to know, what a great thing to say, hey, listen, I didn't always have the answers and I struggled with this, but here's what I figured out along the way. I would be drawn to that leader if I heard it. So let me, I'm kind of laying the foundation for us to talk about storytelling. What, now, what's your take on what I just said? Randy, uh, first of all, agree with you 100%. And I want to draw everyone's attention again to something you said because it's so rich. You were talking about all the stages of vulnerability. And I think that's a really yes. nice way for us to think about it. So for everyone thinking, Randy and I are practical guys. You know that about us. We, we like process. We also like stuff like vulnerability. So turning that into process is a way mm -hmm. for us to access it. So a great way for you all to start is how often do you say I'm sorry? Even mm -hmm. at home to your spouse. Mm -hmm. That's baseline, folks. If you can't do that, we have a vulnerability issue, and that's mm -hmm. going to turn into a trust problem for you. So mm -hmm. saying, I'm sorry, saying, I need your help, that's kind of the baseline. As we move further in, we get into stories, and we get mm -hmm. into our own personal stories. And I would say there are uh, two levels of that. One is what Randy's talking about. Here's a professional misstep that I made a few years ago. This is what I learned from it. Okay, That brings people in. Mm -hmm. Often, that's the kind of thing we might talk about in an interview. Tell me about a time when you failed. Tell me about a time when you struggled with mm -hmm. the change initiative. Okay. Those are the kinds of things we might expect to hear in an interview. Then there's the further into the kind of storytelling, which can be really powerful and really hard to do. That mm -hmm. is telling more of your deeper personal story. Mm -hmm. What was maybe that really significant moment in life, that, that hardship or that tragedy, that thing that happened to you mm -hmm. that really changed your tra trajectory, makes you mm -hmm. seem differently. Um, that's a really, really powerful story. It's what makes you human. And I tell you, it's really, really hard to tell those stories, but if mm -hmm. you can learn how to master that, the, the, the level of trust that happens on the back end of that is incredible. Mm -hmm. I used to teach this to executive MBAs mm -hmm. and that I, they'd have to go off and write their two page version of their story. And I'd give them kind of some prompts and they'd come back and then they'd have to go off in groups and tell their story. They, <laughs> you've never yeah. seen so many like 45 year olds say they lost their homework. Uh, no, you're going to have to go tell your story. Never, no one ever wanted to do it. But when they came back, they said, that was one of the most life-changing experiences I've ever had. I yes. had no idea that this person had had this happen to her or him. Mm -hmm. I see them completely differently. 
And it was scary to tell my story, but then people will say, gosh, I see you so differently. Mm -hmm. So it's so, so powerful. So um, Randy, yes, I, I, I think absolutely. The power of storytelling and telling our own story is so, so rich, brings people in. And it's scary because we're, we're, we may be exposing something that is really, really, even though it might not be our fault at all, something happened to us when we were little, it's still this, this raw thing that we often hide. Um, but we we deeply want to connect with people on that level. So it's a, it's a real powerful tool. Yeah, I think a lot of our listeners probably value um, mental filters, frameworks, the way to think about things. Maybe one of the ways to think about vulnerability is look at it as teachable moments. The first element of this is you recognizing a vulnerability and learning yourself. What can I learn from my vulnerability? How can I stop wallowing in it or fretting about it or worrying about it and actually figure out a way to make it work for me? How can I overcome it or how can I repurpose it to make it into something that's valuable? But then the teachable moment, once you grow and, and own it yourself, is how can I teach others? So we talked about storytelling. How can I start to weave in my teachable moments, my vulnerabilities into my conversations with other people? And again, along the way, this is all, this is all nuanced and complicated, but we've got to use discernment and judgment always. You know, you and I've talked about, and, and with some humor, you know, you meet people sometimes, you sit down, you say, how are you doing? And they just tell you everything and that can feel uncomfortable. They may, they may just want to dump it on the table to relieve, you know, to relieve the pressure they're feeling, but it may be uncomfortable for us to hear. So you have to read the room. You have to read the audience, discern, is this a good time for me to talk about that? You know, my, my spouse has COVID, uh, is this the right time for me to talk about the fact that, um, um, I, you know, flunked out of college, you know, what, what, when is the right moment to share these things? So, Again, thinking about discernment and judgment, but I think teachable moments is a good sort of guiding uh, North Star. I'm going to learn from this, my vulnerabilities, but I also want to start getting to the place where I can share them with others. You know, I was um, I was with a CEO uh, coaching client of mine about three months ago, and we were just kind of talking about, you know, how he grew up, just background, just, really, just getting to know each other. And he said, Randy, you know, I've got a dilemma and I, I really want to get your help with this. Uh, and by the way, he told me to share this story. I, I'll keep it generic. But he said, I know that I am a hard person to get to know. I know that people struggle to get close to me. And I've always wondered, how do I overcome that? And as he was telling me about his background, he grew up in foster homes. Um, he had a really difficult childhood. He uh, worked his way through school, uh, went on and got his MBA. He, uh, you talk about pull yourself up from your bootstraps. And I told him, I said, listen, that's a very deep and personal story. And I'm grateful that you shared it with me, but I'm also inspired. And think about the opportunity to inspire the people around you by talking about what you really get, what you really understand about adversity for, for them. You understand what it's like to, to have difficult times. You've had incredibly difficult times. So we worked that day on him turning that into a compelling story. And not only does he tell that story now, but he's got several others that that really have helped people connect to him better. So you, you and I both have similar stories like that, but I love that the CEO turned what was a painful past into a way to build bridges to other people. Yeah, oh, beautiful. I love that. And so I want to build on what you just said, sure. talking about kind of use discernment and we're going to be thoughtful about that. And again, we're practical guys, process. We don't tell our personal story on day one. Right. Okay. Powerful story, but that's too much too soon. It's like, whoa, yes. whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't know that about you. Now I don't even know you. And now I've got this heavy thing that I don't even know how to interact with you. We don't do that. So if you go back to the trust formula, mm -hmm. trust formula has three, three components to it, folks, credibility, mm -hmm. authenticity, and vulnerability. Okay. So for just for, without going into the formula in more depth, we want to start with credibility first. We really, sh and that's all about meeting expectations, being responsive, getting our work done, being reliable, consistent. Those are components of credibility. We move into authenticity. We share a little more of our thinking, share a little more of our motives, and then we move into vulnerability. And we start with the prompts that I've already offered. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, my, that, I dropped the ball. I could use your help. Um, you know, all those sorts of things. And then we use our story later as a way to accelerate trust. Ideally, mm -hmm. if you're a C-level leader, maybe after a couple of years of working with the team and in a perfect time, 
when your team is going through adversity and you say, team, mm -hmm. I, I want to share this story with you. I've never shared with you before. And then you tell this story about your life and how you over overcome adversity. Uh, by the way, if you are listening to this, you've overcome adversity. Every mm -hmm. single person on this planet has an inspiring story in some way or another. I know that to be true. You may not believe it, but I know it absolutely to be true. I've, I've done this exercise with enough people to see their stories and say, wow, mm -hmm. everybody's gone through something. So there's a time and place to do it. So Randy, I, I love that you gave that example of that CEO. And if you, and if you do it in the right time, boy, it just, it allows the organization to see you differently and then follow you perhaps mm -hmm. when you're taking them into a season of change. So I, yeah. I love that. You know, you and I often talk about transparency invites transparency. Well, vulnerability invites vulnerability. You know, I'll just give you a quick example. I referred to it earlier, but I find that my willingness to talk openly and publicly about what it's like to have a special needs child and the, and the blessings of that and the challenges of that, I cannot tell you how many times people have said, oh my gosh, I have a son with Down syndrome. I have a daughter with autism. I have a, I have a, a child with whatever. And just my willingness to share it gives someone else permission to do the same. And think about what a powerful leadership tool that is. You know, you as a leader share something that might just unlock that in another person. So I love the, I love the nature of vulnerability when it actually creates these incredibly affirming conversations where you get to know each other. But to your point, that's probably not gonna happen in the, the first time you meet someone. But over time, as you've built trust, that's one of those things that just needs to evolve over time where, let me tell you about a time when, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one. What does C.S. Lewis say? Friendship begins at the moment when you realize that, oh, I thought I was the only one. You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but I think that's what he said. So I love the idea that, that the vulnerability if done well is going to give the other person permission and invite them to do the same. Another great reason to practice it. Yeah, so I've got a couple more thoughts on vulnerability, and then I'll, I'll leave it to you if you have any more closing thoughts on this really important topic, Randy. I'm glad sure. that we're talking about today. Yeah. So uh, the first one is, to your point, kind of matches, you kind of, you match levels. Mm -hmm. It takes courage to be yes. vulnerable. Yes. This, is a, this is an act of leadership courage or courageous leadership. Okay, that's what this is. So this is not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to challenge yourself to be a courageous leader, take this on because it's hard. Because you're going to use it in situations where people are armored up mm -hmm. and you're going to walk in the door and drop all your armor and weapons. And mm -hmm. that's going to invite them to do the same thing. So I'll, I'll share with you a kind of a fun example. So this was some years ago, I was working with a company that uh, is, a, is a private company. <coughs> but they work with prisons. So essentially, mm -hmm. you know, uh, prisons all around uh, uh, the U.S., uh, whether they're government prisons or state prisons, um, they'll often outsource the management of those prisons to other companies, private companies like this one. So this company has wardens that they put into these prisons. And so I'm doing this workshop with all these wardens. So we've all seen movies with prison wardens, right? You, you, you know, Shawshank Redemption, you know, Arr. okay. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to get that. That's not what these guys were like at all. And, and women, they were all, they were um, the most laid back, kind of had this like um, quiet kind of counselor, therapist, priest kind of vibe about them. Mm -hmm. a, little, a little, a little overweight, you know, glasses, you know, just, just calm and chill. And, and I was in the line for food one day during one of these workshops I was leading. And I turned to one of them next to him. I said, you're not at all what I expected with prison wardens. They said, yeah. They said, there's a reason for that. They said the inmates, the whole, the whole community, they feed off of the energy of the leader. Mm -hmm. We're all, then they're going to be all, and we're going to have a lot of riots on our hands. Yes. But if we're very calm and relaxed, they're going to be calm and relaxed too. So I love that mm -hmm. idea of sometimes we've got to be the first one to change that dynamic. Now, the last thing I would also yeah. offer in this, as, as you've talked about, Randy, is, uh, this is really powerful in the right doses and when you don't need a lot of it. So you yes. don't need to overload vulnerability. Uh, then that yes. will start cutting into your credibility. So yes. I, I want to be careful. We're not saying be vulnerable in every single conversation. That's not what we're saying. We're saying it is a tool to use in the right circumstance that is very powerful. Right. 
Right. And so I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a more of a gen generic example. Like if I if I joined your team, and the first day of me coming to work in your organization on your team, you know, I came and sat down and said, "Hey, everybody, I'm really excited to be here. I just want to learn. I'm going to take lots of notes. I just want to get a better sense of how we operate." I don't know much about your culture. Don't know much about kind of what makes you all successful. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to spend some time really learning and asking lots of questions. Well, you all would say, gosh, we, we like this branding guy. That's a little bit of vulnerability and leading with. Now, if every meeting for the next six months, I come down and sit down and give you that same preamble. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything. I'm just here to learn. Uh, you right. all have, have all the answers. I'm just taking notes. At some point, you're going to say, why did we hire this guy? Like, yeah. I thought he was going to eventually do something sure. for us. Sure. So we don't do it all the time, but in the right doses, when we need to change the dynamic, invite people in, drop armor and weapons, you know, like those inmates, for example, you know, <clears throat> it, it can be a really powerful tool. So I just want to give that a couple more kind of uh, final thoughts on my end around how we might think about it and how we might use it. All good stuff. And, and I think what I'm about to say, which will you know, be a nice pivot from what you said, probably is going to create the need for another show on this. So earlier, uh, the closing thoughts, earlier I talked about vulnerability invites vulnerability. I want to I want to reverse that because I was talking about the leader being vulnerable can invite others to be vulnerable. But another way to look at that is someone on the team is sharing something that you can tell is obviously it's a form of vulnerability. One of the greatest ways that we can show empathy to our colleagues is to say, you know what? Thanks for sharing that. I've been through something similar. You know, a colleague could share, I'm going through a painful divorce right now. Oh, you know, I, I've dealt with that myself or whatever it is. So there's a there's a, a, an interesting sort of other way to think about transparency or vulnerability, inviting vulnerability is as a leader, making sure people know that you really hear them. I've heard you say with humor many times when someone says something and you respond with, that's great for you. That's a horrible response. Good for you. <laughs> Good for you. So uh, anyway, that's one that's one point I'd close with. The other the other thing I would I would do, and this is probably going to create the need for another show on this, is we often talk about, and we had a show not long ago about teaching Gen Z, teaching young professionals, and what we can learn from them and what they can learn from us. Great show, one of my favorite conversations. But I want us to think about if you're a uh, a team member, maybe you're a young professional, maybe you're a little bit more established in your career. One of the things that you can do with vulnerability is share, hey, I'm struggling with this aspect of my job. And, and don't stop there with the revelation that I'm, I'm vulnerable here, but then go on to say, I would really love your help. Can you guide me, teach me, show me how to do this? So taking your vulnerability, to your point, it takes courage to say, I'm not good at this, but then immediately ask for help. So if you're a team member, a young professional, you could be a senior executive, doesn't matter. One of the ways that you can utilize vulnerability and connect it to learning is to say, I'm struggling, but I could sure use your help to get better at this. And then flip that around. You know, let's say that you're a leader teaching the team. We talked about this earlier. Um, not only say we need to do better at candor or clarity or communication, but say, let me give you an example about when I was at this point in my career that you're at, what I didn't do very well and how I overcame it. So I guess what I'm saying is really connect the idea of vulnerability to teaching moments and learning moments. And I think if we come at it from both team member perspective and the leader perspective, vulnerability can be a powerful way to help all of us grow. And I think that would be a that would be a good thing for the workplace. Yeah, Randy, beautiful. I love that. And I love that, you know, you to sum that up really well, I think, you know, you're saying, and it goes back to kind of full circle, it is a tool, it should have a purpose. So we we use it for a reason. We use it for teachable mm -hmm. moments. We use it to bring people in. Yes. We use it to change the dynamic. Everyone's, you know, hostile and angry. We're going mm -hmm. to settle that down. We're going to change the dynamic. So mm -hmm. we don't go in there just to tell a story, just to tell a story. You're doing it for a reason. And, and and that's that's really why we tell stories, but also mm -hmm. why we why we're vulnerable. We're doing it for a reason, um, and so that's another way to think about it. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a tool again that can be in the right setting. There's no nothing that beats it. Uh, well, Randy, I think I think you're right. I think we may have to do a part two because uh, we 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 talked about this at a general level, but talking about how to create a team that embraces this and the power mm -hmm. of that can also be 
a good conversation for us. So I think we've set up another conversation, my friend. I think we have. And listen, if you're listening to this and struggling to find people to follow, to emulate that you think do this well, look in the mirror and just be the model yourself. Do what you can today, next week, just to take baby steps in the practice of vulnerability. Take what we said to ditch study Brene Brown, whoever you want. But if you don't see it modeled well around you, then you be the role model. And that would be our challenge to you today. Yeah, I, I agreed, Randy. You were cutting out a little bit, but you, absolutely, Randy's exactly right. Take it as baby steps. Take the idea of vulnerability and think about what can you start doing. Look in the mirror. Think about what can you start doing right now to move the needle on that. Because as we always end our Leadership Boundary podcast, what's one thing you heard today that you can put in place that's going to start to help you and your teams tomorrow? So with that, everyone, uh, take this on. Notice is the mm-hmm. first step and see what you can do. Vulnerability is a powerful tool, and and for the leaders using it in the right way, it can accelerate trust like nothing else.